Namaste, and welcome to the 27th episode of Vuladu Narpadu. And uh, some of my friends were asking me, well, why haven't you posted a video lately? And the reason is I was doing research for this verse. Uh, this is a pretty heavy verse. And I felt I had to experience the states described in the verse before I could speak on it. So uh, that's been quite a process, a week or 10 days of intense sadhana. And fortunately, I had uh, some good astrological transits that uh, helped me. So I went deep into the sadhana and actually experience this. This is a principle of mine. I don't speak on things which I haven't experienced. I don't talk about theory. I only talk about my experience. Uh, so uh, that's why there's been quite a delay. <laughs> I had to go into Shankaracharya and everything uh, to get this. So the verse. The state in which this I, the ego, which arises as if the first, does not arise, is the state in which I am that. Unless one scrutinizes the source, the real self from which I arises, how to attain the state of egolessness, the destruction of the individual self, in which I does not arise. And unless one attains that non-arising of I, say, how to abide in one's own real state, the natural state of self, in which I am that. So this is another one of those convoluted uh, classical Tamil verses. But I prefer Sadhu Om's translations because he gets into all the nuances and supplies the inferred uh, words and meaning as well as the literal. He doesn't try to simplify it, but he gives the whole meaning when I really like that. So Sadhu Om goes on to comment on, on a note in this verse. In scriptures it is taught that instead of feeling I am this body, we should experience I am that. In other words, I am Brahman, the absolute reality. The state of experience, which is thus referred to as I am that, or I am Brahman, is only one's real and natural state in which one abides as the pure adjunctless existence consciousness, I am without rising as the adjunct mixed feeling, I am this body. Therefore, in order to experience the truth denoted by the words, I am that, one must attain the state in which the ego, the feeling, I am this body, does not arise. And in order to attain this state of egolessness, one must scrutinize the source of the ego, for only when one scrutinizes its source, the real self, the pure consciousness I am, will the ego subside and be found to be non-existent. So, this is the sadhana. This is the process by which one arrives at self-realization. So, this self-realization, in the beginning, is momentary. In the Vedas, and also to a certain extent in Buddhist teaching, the words this refer to the body, and that refers to the reality, the Brahman, Nirvana, Nirvana, the Absolute. So instead of thinking, I am this, one should think, I am that. However, as pointed out in the previous verse, there are not two selves. 
is only one self. So when we see in meditation, for example, the vision of Brahman or the light, uh, if you're meditating properly with good concentration, you should see light. I've been seeing nice, bright light in my meditation now since, oh my God, 1982? A long time. So what does that mean? Are we really seeing the self? No. What we're seeing is Atma Abhasa, or the reflection of the self in the purified mind. By meditation, one purifies the mind so that, at least temporarily, it does not give rise to incorrect identification such as I am the body. I am the body is called an upadi, a limiting adjunct. And the limiting adjunct of the jiva, the individual being, is I am the body. Whereas the limiting adjunct of Brahman is I am Ishwara, I am the God, <laughs> the controller, creator, and so on. So when these adjuncts, when these upadis, are taken away by the process of self-realization, then one realizes the real situation. I am that. So in other words, we don't see that, the Brahman, or the self, as something separate. As Ramana is fond of saying, the only way to see that is to be that. So in other words, we become Brahman. We actually realize or experience ourself as Brahman. Now, some people misinterpret this and they want to say, I am God. No, <laughs> no. Because in that state, one has no conception of I at all. Why is that? Because in Brahman, there is no differences. It's called undifferentiated, unbounded, one without a second. So if there's nothing to distinguish self from not self, then there's no such concept as I, because I is only real in distinction to that. You follow? In other words, in duality, we have the concept of self and not self. I and others, you and he. You know? I am the first person, you and he are the second and third persons. And of course, there's that, which is also third person. So in self-realization, we no longer make this distinction. Therefore, I becomes meaningless. And also you and he and that <laughs> all becomes meaningless. In the non-dual state, there is no difference. So how can we assert these delimiting adjuncts, upadi, see? So in that state of pure subjectivity, one is only aware of being, not identity, because identity means thinking that two different things are the same, isn't it? So in the world of Brahman, there is no identity because there are no two things. There's no duality. So in this way, one simply feels amness beingness, pure consciousness. And this is uh, not seen outside oneself, but felt within oneself as a warm effulgence or radiance coming from the heart. And it has a, a kind of transcendental emotion of lovingness associated with it. 
uh, as the Ribhu Gita says, uh, speaking in the voice of Brahman, I am amiable, friendly, not attached, not possessive, but simply friendly, <laughs> amiable to all. And I am not against any action. So we see people who have realized Brahman do not have hard and fast rules about what is right, what is wrong, what one should do, what one not, should not do. Huh? They're very open, very broad-minded, very accepting. And it has to be like that, because again, without upadis, without limiting adjuncts, then everything is cool, right? <laughs> because nothing can hurt Brahman. Nothing can hurt one who has realized Brahman either. Confirmed. <laughs> There's a story about Alexander, Alexander the Great. He was in India and he was about to leave. And before leaving India, he wanted to find a real sage. So he had his men go out and inquire, who is a real sage? And after searching high and low, asking everywhere, they finally found this one man sitting naked by the side of the river, doing nothing. And they said, ah, you are real sage. <laughs> Everyone tells us, you come with us. Alexander wants to speak with you. And the sage says, no, I am that. I am Brahman. I do not take orders from anybody. And they said, well, you have to come or we're going to kill you. And he said, you can kill this body, but that has no effect on me. Because he was quite aware that he was not the body. So the men went back, scratching their heads, <laughs> and said to Alexander, what happened? So Alexander came himself. And he spoke with the wise man. And the wise man said, I feel sorry for you. You are so poor. And Alexander said, what do you mean? I have this huge empire and I have thousands of men uh, ready to do whatever I say, even die for me. And I have so much wealth and so much this and that. And the wise man said, that's nothing. I am everything. I am Brahman. So one begins to feel this sense of lordship uh, in this state. Uh, I'll read you an excerpt from Shankaracharya's Dakshinamurti Stotra, verse 10. Since the all selfhood has been thus explained in this hymn, by hearing it, by reflecting on its purpose and meaning, by meditating on it, reciting it aloud, and chanting it congregationally, there will naturally manifest lordship. Ishvaratam is the Sanskrit word. The supreme splendor of all selfhood and the eight forms of imperishable supernormal power. So, uh, I'm thinking to do a series on this Dakshinamurti Stotra. It's so wonderful. And uh, I've been practicing it in the way that's indicated here, by reciting, by contemplating, meditating upon, and also chanting the Gayatri Mantra. But even Gayatri Mantra still is from the platform of I am that. In other words, some difference some distinction or duality between oneself and Brahman, whereas all of Shankara's work is uh, perfectly on the platform of non-duality, and this results in lordship, Ishwaratam. And that, of course, 
is lordship without desire, without identification, without ownership. You see? So the people who, who blithely say, I am that means I am God, are completely bogus because you can see they are not without desire. They are not without identification. They still think they are their bodies. And they still want recognition and so on like that. So in this way, it's they're exposed <laughs> that they haven't really actually realized. In fact, one of the reasons why I didn't make this video sooner was that every time I thought about it, I could feel like slipping into duality again because I have to talk with you. <laughs> I have to make a distinction between myself and you. Otherwise, I'm just talking to myself and what's the use of that? <laughs> so I had to wait until an opportune time when I was more or less uh, coming out of that state down into more ordinary consciousness so I could make this video. Om Tatsa, Om Harihi Om.